The Living in a Dynamic World Gallery showcases the beautiful and astonishing variety of life, cultures, and climates found in all corners of our planet. Here, we will lean on the museum's vast collection of global artifacts and plant and animal specimens as our compass to explore the world. This gallery reimagines the exhibits on the current museum's third floor, which take visitors to different regions around the globe to explore the diversity of people, plants, animals, and habitats. What might feel a little bit different in the future museum is that the Living in a Dynamic World Gallery is an unconventional journey to five distinct landscapes that we find across multiple countries and continents, exploring what makes them unique as well as similar. We are showing sample sketches of four of those landscapes now. And the final gallery will also have exhibits that discuss life and conditions in the mountains. The Living in a Dynamic World Gallery is about a variety of distinct landscapes, but it's also about how people are connected and how the challenges and opportunities that these peoples face in these places present. Something that's really important is we don't want to just focus on how people have shaped the landscapes, but how the landscapes have shaped us. Each of the five landscapes will be illustrated through what we're calling a cultural case study. So we're going to zoom in and focus on a specific cultural group. We aren't just looking at ancient cultures of peoples who lived long ago. We are looking at people who are carrying traditions that are thousands of years old forward. And in living in a dynamic world, we're consulting with the origin communities, the communities, the peoples, the nations that the artifacts have come from and the stories have come from so that we are trying to tell these stories as authentically as possible through their own voices, through their own words. But before you enter each of these landscapes, we wanted to set the stage. So accompanying each of these landscapes are what we are calling a mosaic. And these mosaics feel like a cabinet of curiosities. When you enter the cabinet of curiosities, you are seeing, okay, this is what defines a desert. But as you peel back the layers, you begin to understand that not all deserts are the same. Not all people or organisms that live in the deserts are the same. So these mosaics are a place to both dig into the dynamics that define these landscapes, but also to explore the diversity of these landscapes. Once your curiosity is piqued, we then want people to push through the door and feel like they are going through the wardrobe to Narnia into that landscape as you leave the mosaic. Deserts are places where water is scarce and temperatures are intense. This also means life in the desert has become stunningly resourceful. We focus storytelling in the desert landscape around the American Southwest. We really have a wide range of ceramics, textiles, and agricultural items representing the cultures originating from the region. You can see that we want the space to feel very immersive, like you really are in a desert. You have those beautiful pinks and blues, the contrast of what it feels like to be in that part of the American Southwest. Most importantly in the foreground is the rattlesnake button. Yes, there will be a rattlesnake button. Maybe there'll be more than one. We're also looking forward to working with the Hopi. We are hoping to depict a traditional home that is actually built of the earth. And here we want to dig into those materials that are available in that specific landscape, looking at the minerals, the rock, the actual earth, and how that has influenced the culture there. So that's the culture in terms of how they built their homes and why they built their homes in the way that they did, but also in looking at very sophisticated parts of their culture, like their ceramics traditions. We're excited about the opportunity to possibly work with the descendants of Nampeo, who was an incredibly skilled ceramicist, and she almost single-handedly was able to maintain Hopi pottery traditions by passing down what she knew and what she had learned to her daughter and granddaughters. So in contrast to the Hopi culture, which is a contemporary culture live and thriving here in the United States today, we want to take visitors back in time to ancient Egypt. It's not a coincidence that ancient Egyptian cultures mummified their dead. There's a really good reason for that. The ancient Egyptian traditions around death and death rites have been defined by that landscape. And we want to reveal that, we want to share that in this gallery. The Arctic is one of the most extreme regions of our planet, 
with some of the harshest environments, and yet it provides a variety of life. One of the defining features of the Arctic is the sunlight, or lack of sunlight, depending on the season. Our immersive Arctic scene is set at midnight on a midsummer day when the sun is still up, casting a dim glow across the frozen tundra. We are looking forward to concentrating on the Sami culture. This is a group of people who continue to practice their traditions today, but their traditions are steeped in thousands of years of history and of cultural knowledge. So here you're seeing the reindeer, which they have a really important relationship with. So we'll be exploring that relationship with the reindeer. We also have a, what we're calling a little kitty call. Here it is a traditional Sami tent. So we have these spaces for our youngest and littlest visitors where they can sort of crawl in and feel a little bit cozy. We also, as a cultural counterpoint, are looking forward to working with the Inuit to talk about the importance of hunting and fishing, particularly in the winter during the darker and coldest months and how that sustains life and how that has been a really important part of their culture. The beloved walrus, we wanted to make sure we held on to that. The walrus is of huge cultural importance, dietary, spiritual importance, material importance, really talking about how the walrus plays an important part in Arctic cultures. Grasslands consist of expansive, flat areas that are home to an abundance of life, including some of our largest land mammals, and have long been used by humans for agricultural purposes. We have a really tremendous opportunity when we're focusing on the grasslands landscape where we want to take people to the African Serengeti. It's a huge place on the planet. It's filled with a multitude of very, very different cultures that are responding to that landscape in distinctive ways. And of course, we wanted to make space for the beloved Timba and Simba, two of the most important characters of the museum. One of the displays that I'm really excited about is sacred animals. So for some people, the lions are sacred. Others, the elephant is sacred. And to look at those animals through different cultural perspectives really opens our eyes up to appreciating these organisms in different ways. But also as a cultural counterpoint is to bring people back to the American plains and to look at indigenous plains peoples and how their environment is similar and different when we think about island ecosystems and communities, we tend to think about places that are remote and even isolated. But islands can also be a place where groups of organisms and people from different places come together, connecting some of our larger land masses. Our island exhibit is focused on life on the many islands in the South Pacific, as well as life in Japan. So in contrast to the dryness of the desert or the extreme temperatures of the Arctic, in the islands, we want to take you to the Indo-Pacific, the tropical islands of Micronesia specifically, where we are going to encounter a diversity of objects that are representative of a diversity of cultures that call that place home. We're looking at maritime navigation, how people got around those islands. We're looking at fishing and resource use. We're also looking at the way that people have used something like shells, tortoise shells, seashells, not just for practical reasons, but for adornment, for jewelry, even for money. We're also looking at the use of materials like bamboo, as well as musical instruments, and even looking at tattoo cultures and ornamentation on the human body. In contrast to the Indo-Pacific and the diversity of cultures there, we're also looking at a very specific culture indigenous to the Japanese island, the Ainu. Towards the rear of the gallery, this is one of the moments where we have a window. The window will be placed up high above to allow some natural light in and be playful here. So we would use the natural light to create sort of a water effect. So you really do feel like you are outside enjoying a nice tropical breeze. Located on the same floors as two of our galleries, including living in a dynamic world, is a brand new visitor experience that we're very excited to bring to the new museum. It's unlike anything we have in the current building. 
Really early on in the community input process, we established five building blocks for the Future Museum. One of those building blocks is turning the museum inside out. Most visitors don't know that we have four million priceless objects and specimens in our care. These are called the collections. And while some of them are on display in the exhibits, the majority are kept behind the scenes. Oftentimes the collections are used for research purposes, both by MPM scientists and cultural experts, but also by researchers and institutions from all around the world. The Mixing Zones, which is a working title for two spaces in the building, are an opportunity for visitors not just to see the science and research that goes on behind the scenes, but really actively engage with it. In the Burke Foundation Mixing Zone, visitors will have an opportunity to do hands-on science education. This is a great interactive space for this type of learning to be accessible to all of our visitors. And in the other Mixing Zone, there will be a focus on our cultural collections and our cultural partners and being able to showcase some of the amazing cultural work going on in this community and across the state. These dynamic spaces are really meant to be very flexible. It's a space where visitors can be engaged in hands-on science learning, participate in a lecture, view a cultural dance or performance, connect with community partners, and more. The Mixing Zones also offer a view into the collection storage areas, where collections items will be visible and rotated in and out frequently. One really exciting element of the design of the Future Museum is the three-story case, displaying everything from ancient glyptodons all the way up to our botanical collections. This case is visible from both Mixing Zones. So from the bottom Mixing Zone, you can see all the way up three floors. And from the upper mixing zone, you can see all the way down to the first floor. And you get really different views of the items coming at it from those different directions and perspectives. It gives visitors an opportunity to see the breadth and depth of the collections showcased in a really fantastic way. The museum serves all types of learners, from little children all the way up to PhDs. And we've been very intentional about creating experiences that engage people in their way of learning. In a lot of our engagement sessions with community members, they've articulated the need for the museum to be a space where people can come together and learn. Milwaukee means gathering place. The mixing zones give us an opportunity to really bring people together, create a space for learning and shared understanding, dialogue and growth, and much, much more. The museum in that tradition is meant to be a gathering place of all of the people of this community and across the state and throughout the world.